Hi, I'm Sean with the Sacramento History Museum. It's another episode of Museum Mondays, and for July we're talking baseball. Uh, we have been walking past the graveyards of long gone ballparks in Sacramento. We have talked to a man from the Gold Rush era who was an early practitioner of the game of baseball. This time we joined in a conversation about Sacramento's rich baseball legacy and also its future with two men who rightly wear the name Mr. Baseball. One of them is Todd Sullivan. I call him Mr. Baseball. Full disclosure, we, we work a block apart in Old Sacramento. He's a custom jewelry designer at Scallop Family Jewelers. He works with real diamonds and baseball diamonds. And I'm sure he hasn't heard that a bazillion times before, but we've had chance conversations about baseball when we meet on the streets of Old Sacramento. And over time, it dawned on me how much he is connected to baseball in Sacramento from youth to prep to college to pro baseball. He knows his stuff. Todd is a pitching coach for Kennedy High School and runs his own pitching and baseball consultancy. The other is Leon Lee, the preeminent ambassador for baseball in Sacramento. Leon grew up here in Sacramento. He was a Grant High graduate. Uh, by the way, Todd was a Valley High graduate. Leon Lee did something different in professional baseball. He played seven seasons in the minor league system for the St. Louis Cardinals. But whereas some players would spend their twilight of their career overseas, Leon decided to spend the prime of his career in Japan. And he and his brother, Leron, who encouraged him to come over with him in Japan, turned out to be a powerful duo for the Lotte Orions. Leon Lee was also the first African-American manager in Japanese professional baseball. They come from a baseball dynasty family. Leon's son, Derek Lee, played 15 seasons of Major League Baseball. He was a three-time Gold Glove winner, a two-time All-Star, World Series champion in 2003, and the National League batting champion in 2005. Leon and his brother, Leron, were consultants in the 1992 movie, Mr. Baseball, starring Tom Selleck as an aging Major League Baseball veteran who went to Japan to play. The character played by actor Dennis Haysbert, Max the Hammer Du Bois, is modeled in part by the two brothers. These gentlemen have given generously of their time this morning to talk baseball. They're going to talk about the rich baseball history that they grew up in, and they are going to talk about something passionate in both of their lives, that is the future of baseball in Sacramento. When I was seven years old, my older brother, Leron Lee, was, you know, he was like a, a local baseball guy. You know, he was five years older than me, and he's 12, 13 years old, all-stars. And, and during that era, the Bob Olivers, the Steve Greens, the Leon and Curtis Browns, the Larry Boas, the, I mean, baseball was huge when I was seven years old when I first started playing. So I had a lot of heroes to revert to yep. refer to because my dad loved baseball. We would go down to Candlestick Park and see Giants games. And then I come right back here to Sacramento and realize that man, we had a lot of uh, the McNamara's, uh, guys that were actually playing pro ball already. Uh, um, and there was, there was, you know, unlike today, you know, kids don't really have a lot of baseball heroes. Well, I had a lot of baseball heroes. I didn't know anything about basketball. I didn't know anything about football. All I knew was all of our heroes were baseball. And, and at the time, my uncle was playing in the old Negro Leagues. So around our dinner table, the only conversation we ever had was baseball. And so the only thing that I really ever fantasized about was baseball. baseball. And to question myself, can I do this? So every time I went out, and my father would always have me playing with the older guys, the older kids, the older kids. So over the years, you know, as I grew in baseball, I never ever thought I was good enough. I never thought I was good, period. But other people kept saying I was, so that was kind of my validation. 
they didn't tell me I was good at anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but they did tell me I was good at baseball. My mom would always say, you can't play baseball unless you get your grades up. So it was really baseball that made me smarter. <laughs> you know, my reading, reading, studying, getting good grades, always making sure that the grades were there so I was always allowed to be able to play baseball. So it was a lot of motivation going on. And so it's just a lot of history. That was pretty much the beginning of what I learned because I was coming up, you know, in South Sacramento, played at Parkway Little League, but, you know, all the action was in Land Park. You know, so when you're in Lamb Park, when you got the Greg Vaughn, Nick Johnson, uh, you know, you, Lavelle Friedman, uh, Mark Cole. I mean, you can just every decade from the 50s on, there is a good dozen to two dozen players right from our local high schools that were dominating, going on to D1 colleges, um, be, creating a minor league and professional baseball career. but. What I think to answer your question is all those people, including Leon and his brother and the Roysters, they're all still here. They all still care. They constantly are giving free clinics, you know, to make sure inner city youth and just kids in general have an opportunity to learn the game of baseball, uh, to play the game of baseball and to, you know, be around names that they've heard about while growing up and I really think that if it wasn't for the generational history of the Sacramento heritage of baseball players wanting to care and to stay in the 916 area that's what keeps baseball alive because every decade it's a large group of people and each one of those decades refer to the decades that came before them so to me it's just the people caring and giving at a constant level you know even you know till now you know because we have there's over 16 kids in the Sacramento area right now that are playing on a big league roster uh, I can only speak for Sacramento is that we always had something to come home to we had families we had really good friendships the camaraderie was un unnatural you know we lived on Grand Avenue and Belden and right across the street where Leon and Curtis Brown they all got drafted you know, my dad's best friend who he worked, he was a plumber contractor, was Bob Oliver's dad. Bob Oliver played a lot of years in the major leagues. You know, the, the Boas, the, you know, Nick Johnson is the nephew of Larry Boa. So, you know, you look through all the bloodlines and they just, everybody knows everybody. So it's like when, and I'm in somewhere playing minor league baseball in, you know, whatever, Iowa somewhere. I can't wait to get back to Sacramento. Exactly. Because this is where the camaraderie is. I, I can't say, oh man, the ocean is beautiful. Oh man, they got nice houses here. Oh, they got a nice park. That's not enough to keep me away. That's why the Dusties and the Bob Olivers, everybody, rolling office, Jerry, everybody came home. You know, it's just, to me, it's like, you go play ball, this is what we do. And when the season's over, you come home and have mom's apple pie. You know. When I first signed with St. Louis Cardinals way back in 1971, it seemed like a few years ago, 71 <laughs> was recent, now 71 is ancient, but um, I remember going out in minor league baseball and, and remembering that, you know, wow, the, the, the winter baseball we played in Sacramento at William Land Park was more competitive yep. than playing minor league baseball. It really was. That's when it first hit me that we were playing among stars at a young age. You know, me and Taylor Duncan and Tony Pepper and Johnny Green and all the Robert Miller, you know, and all the guys at Grant High School that we used to play out here at Renfrey and Legion Ball and the, the TLCs, the Tournament of Champions against all the other high schools. And we were considered really good ball players. It didn't hit me until later how good we really were to compete with the guys that were right here in Sacramento, all the way from Little League. I mean, I remember 12-year-old Little League and, you know, playing against the local teams and the Bay Area and Novato. I got my brains beat out by Novato. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it made me realize how strong the talent pool in, on the West Coast is because once I got out of here and went out and played minor league ball, I go, 
I kept comparing players to people I knew in Sacramento. <laughs> he reminds me of this guy, but he's not as good. You know, and it hit me that Sacramento was loaded. I mean, I felt all of a sudden I felt honored that people could recognize me as a good ball player in Sacramento because, you know, I thought I could go anywhere in the country and compete with anybody else. And You know, when I was uh, when I first signed with St. Louis Cardinals, I, I, I kind of start moving up the ladder. Uh, I always, you know, obviously we all have the major league dreams, and uh, a lot of the kids I knew, Taylor Duncan's and everybody moving up, and the guys in the Cardinal organization moving to the big leagues, and I kind of got stuck. Uh, I was the guy that didn't have the position. You know, I wasn't a really fast base runner. I had a good bat, and so I was that tweener I got into, into that 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 rut so my brother had gone over to Japan in 1977 and just had an outstanding year and uh, at the time they're only allowed two Americans per team and then the thought Jimmy Lefevre if you remember Jimmy Lefevre he was my brother's teammate okay. and a player coach so he came over to the United States in 1977 to try to buy my contract because it never had ever been two brothers playing on the same team in Japan before from America and so the, that first year in 77 the Cardinals wouldn't let me go uh, 78 during the offseason they end up selling my contract to Japan and um, I went over there hungry I mean I was really felt like I had something to prove I was at the top of my game I went over there and, and me and my brother that first year in 1978 he hit 316.7. I hit 316.4. He's counting. Oh, man. <laughs> they are. Like, well, he ended up with 317, <laughs> and I ended up with 316 because of that. 316.4 doesn't take you to the next level. Yeah. So that I point had, five matters. That's that point five matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so the media was off the charts in Japan. Baseball, I realized, was so big, and here I was coming out of the minor leagues, and you, normally it's the older veteran. Everybody over there were the older veterans. I was a 25-year-old youngster over there, and I, I, I start learning, really, the conditioning part of the game. I mean, it was a lot of, we just took the game for granted, we played it. The conditioning part came in Japan. I know my first spring training over there, I lost 22 pounds before the opening day. And I never experienced being that good a baseball shape. And that's what I think really elevated me because when I went over, I had a grudge against the Cardinals for number one, letting me go and not getting me to the big leagues. So I had one game, Sean, where I had, uh, I had three home runs and eight RBIs and I had a big front page news article and I folded it up, put an envelope and sent it to St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> I do the same thing. <laughs> It's stuff like that still goes on today. I know, yeah. that's it. You see what you got rid of? I'm over here. And then I realized it really didn't even matter. Yeah. It didn't matter. That's the, that's the business of the game. It's the nature of the game. It was a maturing uh, process. And, and then I settled into saying, okay, here's a challenge. Because playing in Japan is a challenge. The strike zones are a little different. We were looked at a little differently as far as umpires literally told me that strike zone was bigger because if the pitchers had to throw the ball over the plate, we'd hit too many home runs and they had to keep a balance. And, and, and those were days where we had to make those adjustments on a constant basis. But it was wonderful for me because it made me so much better of a ball player. And nowadays when kids cry about a ball being on the black, I mean, being on the black, that's like down the middle. <laughs> it <laughs> you is. Know? There is no yeah. such thing as a strike zone. You see it, you hit it. It's it. It was a culture shock. Uh, for me, you know, it was a blessing for me to have been over there a year after my brother because he was able to teach me a lot of different things. And, and when give I you come the heads home, up and yeah, let you know what it's all about. Yep. And having conversations when I come home in the winter with all the buddies and friends and everybody asked me how it was. You know, he had the good stories that nobody else had, you know. And uh, learning a little bit of the language. The food was good. I mean, Japanese food combination of worldwide food because Tokyo is such an international city you had the pleasure of eating foods from all over the world not just Japanese but also you know I, I think that uh, the uh, the experience of 
of playing in a foreign culture, being an African American too, because a lot of the kids had never even seen African Americans before. I had little kids would come up and rub my arm and see if it come off. Come off. And it was interesting because there was an innocence about it. And then there was some propaganda they had, their stereotypical views of, of what they heard about African Americans in, in the States. And we were kind of like ambassadors because people really, I have to say, they really fell in love with the Lee brothers because we became famous not so much because of what we did on the fields, what we did off the field, you know, spending time with kids and you know, I, I did everything with kids all the time, bought them tickets, come to the ballpark early, you know, giving them high fives. And kids really got a kick out of it. These guys, you know, it kind of broke down some barriers to me. My little share of what I think I did, I was more proud of that. And the fan base I had with kids, you know, there was a little quadriplegic uh, Japanese kid who sewed my name in a towel with his feet. And it made me cry because this kid was a real fan and he would come to the ball field and we embrace, embrace these kids and let them come in the clubhouse and it changes lives. See, that's the biggest satisfaction I have of those experiences because I was a oddity. I was a little different, but I feel like I made the best of it. And, and to me, that's what I'm more proud of than the home runs and whatever. <laughs> Humanity has always been extremely important to me my, my whole life, you know, people that care and show their passions, no matter what their passion is, as long as it's given and sincere, I'm always excited about. And, you know, talking with Leon, having Leon on my show and having a lot of athletes come on my show, you know, Jerry Royster, you know, all these guys and just hearing how they grew up first started making me you know let me that's not how I grew up I need to check this out and when I started to get into the histories and saw their struggles and I saw what they had to be up against just to try to get where they had to get and how it seemed like everybody else had an easier path I started working on my Sacramento dugout show to open that up and I like, look we have to this is our main focus if uh, blacks playing in baseball back in the 70s at its peak was almost 26 percent and now it's barely six percent and every year it keeps dropping i need to know why and i need to help that situation out so i've really been in tune that's why i reached out to like greg vaughn leon lee and all these gentlemen so back in 2009 we did the very first honorary negro league game so we had like jethro mcintyre we had don porter uh, we had all these big time names coming out uh, just to give the recognition from uh, the River Cats. Tony Lasoro, he uh, Asoro reached out to us, and you know when you have the signing of Branch Rickey, and he had it, they were doing an honorary Negro League game every year with the Jackie Robinson Day. They said, hey, we got some local talent. Can we get this here at River Cat Stadium? And so we got Elmer Carter to throw out the first pitch. And I go, you know what? We need to start doing this every year. And then with the, the death of Breonna Taylor, the, you know, the murder of George Floyd, and me getting more upset because I'm seeing people I care about for a year since I was a kid, you know, they were always quiet, always humble about it, but they were affected about it. The more I learned and I understood how they were affected, I wanted to help. And so I reached out to the River Cats and the Savages and said, I want to do this every year. And so the money that was raised uh, from the event is going to the Bob Kendrick from the Negro League Baseball Museum and black owned businesses here in Sacramento from the racial unrest, social unrest. And, you know, with the pandemic, I want to give back to those players. And so the River Cats, you know, they said it was such a great event. We had more people at my event than at the, the game before that they want to do it annually. So now we're in the talks to try to do this annually and we'll be working with Dennis Biddle next year and we'll be working with Linda Page, Satchel Page's daughter. So they'll be coming out. And we had Jerry Manuel and the Atlantic Black Crackers because his dad played for the Atlantic Black Crackers. They coached one team. And then Greg Vaughn and his son, Corey Vaughn, coached the Kansas City Monarchs. Well, this next event, we're gonna have Leon Lee 
and his son Derek Lee, who played, you know, for the Chicago Cubs and played at El Camino High School, they'll be going up against the Roysters, Danny Royster and Jerry Royster. So we already have it in the works. We'll be doing it every year. All proceeds raised will be going back to black-owned businesses, black-owned community events, and to keep the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum alive and to try to keep the word out. It's everybody that we have talked about from the beginning knows about Renfrey and knows the history of Renfrey and knows who played on the field and what was produced on the field and it was truly a minor league base it was one of the first minor league baseball fields after Edmonds Field um, and just the history of everything that has come through um, and with it being shut down for such a long time right now you're seeing weeds that are a little high but before they were taller than the fence and for decades there's been people mainly Leon Lee and a lot of his friends that are trying to put this field back up to what it used to be for the kids in the area to do a community thing to bring this whole area back alive like it was in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s and uh, every time we there is efforts put forward there seems to be something that stands in the way that one thing that constantly gets stands stands in the way is the city <laughs> and so we understand the city's needs and frustrations but I think now especially with the pandemic they need to see the opportunity and let the opportunity happen so we can create something very special for Sacramento. This has been something I've been chasing literally for almost 10 years now to be honest it's longer than people think and then but I you know, I have a strong feeling that if you have a passion for something or a dream for something, and you know, the old saying is if you don't like the games other people playing, then make up your own. And there's a lot of history in this, at this ball field. I have a real passion for it. So I've gone through a number of people who said they were or they could, and for honest reasons, there are things that didn't work out. And people would say, my wife, and sometimes people would say, well, you know, why, why don't you just, you know, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And I'm sure they go, oh, Leon is talking all this, you know, he wants to do it, and it's never going to happen. And I don't really care what, in a way, what people think. People have their thoughts. I just have never learned the word quit. There's a lot of other baseball things that I want to do on a national scale that we're planning to do. But there's something about Renfrey that has to happen. I, I think... God said it's going to happen, and uh, I'm not going to ever give up on it. So, I mean, I'm going to go to my grave. So anybody, my, my eulogy says, well, he died trying. <laughs> and, and, and I always believe, Sean, is in our, in our life and our legacy is that we're either running from something or running to something. I'd rather be running to something. Yeah. I'd be running forward and toward something good and I'm just going to keep running every day I get up I'm going to keep running towards something that's positive for Sacramento I just want to see kids running out here jumping around having fun throwing the ball sliding in umpire safe and out no instant replay if the umpire said you're out you're out my dad told me to do something I did I, I didn't ask him whether he was right or wrong <laughs> right that's I it. mean if he made the call make the call and to me that's the history of baseball that's the way baseball used to be you know, from the old Negro Leagues to Major League Baseball, the Mickey Mantles, the hardcore Ty Cobb. They could say Ty Cobb is the race, most racist guy in baseball, but when he came into second base, it was you against him. God, and they get him, you know, and it's, it's just the way baseball is supposed to be played. I think this field right here still has a lot of years ahead for kids, and when they step on this field, to me, they transform into something they've never been before. Yeah. They step onto history, and I think the history here will engulf them. I really do. I think that when they step on this field, they're going to remember us. They're going to remember all the guys that's been on this field when they sit here. And if you put the monuments up to recognize that the McNamara's and the Roysters and the Vaughns and the Dusty Bakers and the Lees and everybody that played here, and the passion involved in that, we want to transform that to the kids. And to me, this is what this field stands for. Thanks for joining us on Museum Mondays, all about baseball. We close out the month with our museum director, Delta Picmello, who is going to recite for you Casey at the Bat. See you next time.
Please help! 